Sato put the car in park and gave himself a quick check in the mirror. He could have easily gotten a driver to bring him here, but he wanted to be as anonymous as possible. He'd shed his signature coat, donned a dark pair of sunglasses, and swapped out his business attire for a plain and forgettable pair of jeans and dark blue top, coupled with cheap sneakers. He wore his usually well-groomed hair messy and had tucked his locket into his shirt so it couldn't be seen. Being one of the best duelists in the world, as well as CEO of the largest gaming company, made Seto a notable figure, meaning that it could be difficult to go anywhere without being recognized, hence the disguise. No one would think to look for the president of the Kaiba Corporation in a dingy old part of town, dressed like an ordinary Joe and completely lacking his aura of confidence and superiority. That was the whole point of this getup. If word got back to HQ that Seto was digging through old files, it would likely raise a few eyebrows and maybe even get back to his aunt. The last thing he needed was to give her time to concoct another lie, if she was indeed as involved with the worst as he suspected. In addition, he preferred not to have his motives questioned, as people undoubtedly would. Seto had worked hard to gain the public's trust after kicking his stepfather out of the company, but with those who were affected personally by Gozaburo's brutality, relationships were still rocky. Seto didn't need rumors circulating that Kaiba Corp was spiraling back into old habits. Besides, word would get back to Mokuba, who undoubtedly would want to know why Seto was accessing the archives. And even if he didn't tell him, he was a smart boy and would figure it out soon enough, and Seto didn't want to put that kind of pressure on his young shoulders. Not without some solid proof. So, no, nobody could know he was there. No one, that is, except Noah. Seto put his phone to his ear, and his brother's voice spoke to him from the other end. How goes the search? Well, I'm here. And now I'm in. Remind me again why these important and dangerous documents are being kept in an old storage shed and not some high security bunker with motion sensors and, I don't know, lasers or something? It was a strategic decision. No one would think to look for the files here. Even my top employees think they exist in some military style base, far, far away. But what if someone worked it out and decided to break in? What would stop them? Seto smirked. The shed was tiny too tiny. Folders and papers filled the shelves that lined the walls, but every single document was falsified. Seto pulled one of the shelves away to reveal a second door, and next to the door was a panel with a sensor, fingerprint scanner, and keypad. They'd have to get past the lasers and motion detectors. <laughs> That's actually really clever. You're full of surprises, big brother. Seto took the compliment for what it was and went through the necessary steps to enter the deceptively secure hidden room. Eight separate passcodes, a fingerprint scan, and a voice code later, he was in. Once inside, Seto sealed the entrance so it looked undisturbed and removed his glasses. The room was dim, even when he turned on the lights, so he switched on the flashlight built into his phone to see better. I guess I've <coughs> neglected this place a little. But I never thought I'd need to come you're here. You're on the clock. If you're not back by three at the latest, you'll miss that meeting and everyone will question- I know. I got it. Seto walked through the piles of books and boxes until he got to the mountain in the back of the room, where everything pertaining to Sector 1 was neatly stashed. Thankfully, he'd had the foresight at the very beginning to see to it that the records were stored alphabetically. His obsessive-compulsive side had reared its ugly head that day, and he'd been a little more insistent than he needed to be. So finding the employee records was the easy part. The hard part was stomaching what he stumbled upon along the way. Seto? This is... sickening. Our father wasn't known for his strong morals. I know, but this is on a whole other level. I'm seeing words like torture device, mind control, human experimentation. Everything I've come across so far has had a prototype and has been tested. Seto, don't. He was a bad guy. We know that. Just get what you came for. Nothing else you find in those papers will do you any good. Please just stay focused. But it was too late. Seto grew more and more agitated as he flicked through the files. 
He himself had used less than savory methods to achieve his own ends in the past and had done things he wasn't proud of and things he wouldn't repeat if he could do it all over. But never, ever, in his worst, wildest dreams, would he have considered stooping to anything like what went on behind the closed doors in Sector 1. It wasn't just guns Kaiba Corp had manufactured. He'd found documents detailing diseases they'd created and tested, devices that were capable of causing excruciating and debilitating pain, weapons that could cause a lot of people to die slowly and painfully at the same time. And that was only the tip of the iceberg. But that wasn't what would haunt Seto for months, maybe years to come. As he'd told Noah, everything in these files had appeared to have been tested, and the results were recorded in astonishing detail. He found photographs of men, women, sometimes even children. And in these photos, they were being subjected to all kinds of horrors. The tests varied, and sometimes it wasn't immediately obvious what was happening to these people. But the fear and pain on all of their faces was as clear as crystal. Who were they? Seto didn't recognize a single face. Had Gozaburo rounded up people at random? Or were they specifically chosen? Did they have homes? Families? People who missed them? Or were they vagabonds? Homeless. Helpless. And no one to cry for them when they were gone. Seto was usually so well composed and remained that way as he continued to read until he came across a photograph that undid him. The picture was of a little boy, the youngest he'd seen so far, and he was clearly very ill and in pain. He had dark hair and blue-gray eyes just like Mokuba. It wasn't him, of course, but the image struck Seto deep, knocking the wind out of him. He dropped the entire folder and took a step back, and then another, and another, until his back hit a wall. This was too much, even for him. He wasn't particularly sympathetic or empathetic as a general rule, but just the same, he felt his gut wrench in a peculiar way, and his chest began to hurt. It was akin to the way he felt those times when Mokuba had been taken from him and he was forced to confront the idea that he may never see him again. Seto? I'm going to hang up now. I'll call you back when I'm out of here. All right. I guess I'll speak to you soon then. He hung up and set the phone aside before pulling his knees to his chest and burying his face in his arms. He forced his breathing to steady, fighting off a tense wave of nausea. Pictures and documents were scattered around him, And for the life of him, he couldn't figure out why they were overwhelming him so. Sure, it was bad, but he hadn't really expected any less. Perhaps it was because he had something in common with these people. True, he didn't recognize a single person. But they were alike in one glaring way nevertheless. They too knew firsthand the depth of cruelty in his stepfather. Gozaburo was a man who would watch the world burn to warm his own hands, and while he was definitely entirely gone, Seto still had to live with the scars for the rest of his life. He could lock it all up, put those memories in a cupboard and throw away the key. If he could spend the rest of his life like that, it'd all be so easy. But at some point in the day, he had to take his shirt off. And when he did, he had to avoid his reflection at all costs. Because if he didn't, he might just catch a glimpse of the permanent marks left on his skin. The ones that nobody knew about. Not Noah. Not even Mokuba. And if he did, that cupboard might just unlock. And the nightmares might return. And it might just destroy him from the inside out. He loathed that his own emotions had that kind of control over him. But facts were facts. Get a grip. So he did what he always did. He balled his fists, stood up straight, and he enveloped himself in coldness. It was bitter and lonely, but it was safe. His expression, dominated as always by his fittingly steel-blue eyes, became neutral and his arrogant demeanor returned. He gathered up the paper he'd left strewn around, no longer allowing himself to feel the grief or pain they'd caused him before, and calmly replaced everything as he found it. He then gathered up the employee records from where he'd found them at the beginning of all this and strode out of that dusty hellhole, 
with his head held high.